BCY America presents Crosstalk, a nationwide call-in program discussing issues that have an effect on our families, our communities, our churches, our nation, and our world. Crosstalk, an opportunity for you to voice your concerns for biblical principles. And now live by satellite and around the world on the Internet at vcyamerica.org. Here is today's Crosstalk. Well, thank you for joining us today on Crosstalk here on the VCY America Network. The Apostle Paul had warned young Timothy that in the last times, uh, perilous times would come. And uh, certainly, ladies and gentlemen, I believe we are witnessing many perilous times. As we conduct this news roundup today here on Crosstalk, there are going to be many issues and uh, some of them not so pleasant to talk about. But we believe that there is importance in knowing what is going on. It helps us to know how to pray, how to be light, how to be salt, to be involved in uh, situations around us, and to realize the times in which we live. We need to be understanding of the times. And certainly, I trust it will help us to be more fervent in our dedication before the Lord, that we can see today we are not playing games. This is not just hopscotch that we're involved in today in this life we're living. But folks, this is a matter of life and death. It is a matter of uh, staying faithful to the Lord Jesus Christ through times that are called perilous times. We do want to provide an update. There have been many news sources reporting about the fate of the Iranian pastor who is now on death row. It's described as an extremely dangerous turn of events. The American Center for Law and Justice said that it had learned from context inside Iran that Yosef Nardakani, the Christian pastor on death row for apostasy, is looking increasingly likely to be executed. Pastor Yosef's case had been stalled due to increased international pressure, and the Iranian courts request that the supreme leader of Iran, Ayatollah Khomeini, decide Yosef's fate. Now, because Pastor Yosef has continually refused to give in to the regime's demands that he renounce his Christian faith, the likelihood that the Iranian regime will execute him increases by the day. Nardakani is a married father of two young children. He was arrested in October 2009, been sentenced to hang for apostasy. His death sentence uh, was upheld by Iran's Supreme Court last July, but three months later, the case, which was making waves internationally, uh, was referred to the Ayatollah. Lawyers, CompassNews.com is reporting that uh, lawyers for an, the pastor uh, have not received communication from authorities that their client will be executed, despite uh, reports that the death is imminent. Rumors, though, of this imminent execution were leaked out through a source close to one of the lawyers uh, that uh, contacted international media uh, pertaining to this matter, saying that the execution uh, would be carried out. Both the ACLJ and Present Truth Ministries, which has been closely monitoring Nardakani's case, revealed this week that it was believed that the Iranian courts may have signed an execution order for Nardakani. According to the ACLJ, it was unclear whether he will be able to appeal his conviction order. Most of Iran's executions are conducted in secret. Uh, just last week, U.S. Representative Joseph Pitts introduced a resolution to Congress condemning Iran for imprisoning Nardakani and demanding his immediate release. We continue to encourage you, Crosstalk listeners, to intercede on behalf of the Iranian pastor, Yosef Nardakani, facing a death sentence for refusing to recant his faith and refusing to convert to Islam. I'm going to give you a couple of phone numbers. There was a statement that came out earlier from the White House. Many believe that the White House and State Department could be doing so much more. Hillary Clinton, the Secretary of State, can be contacted at area 202-647-5291. 202 647 5291. The Secretary's Chief of Staff, Cheryl Mills, uh, all of these are 202 numbers, so here's the number, 647-5548, 647-5548. The Undersecretary for Political Affairs, Wendy Sherman, 647-2471, 647-2471. And the Undersecretary for Democracy and Global Affairs, 647-1189, 647-1189. The Department of State, uh, the Iran office, 647-2520, 647-2520. Again, contacting your member of Congress, your U.S. Senator, vitally important as well, uh, 
225-3121 and 225-3121. You can also contact media outlets, ABC, CBS, NBC, Fox, to to be involved with this. Uh, Fox's number, 212-852-7111. And uh, time doesn't permit me to go through the, the rest of the, uh, the numbers here at this point, but uh, contacting your member of Congress, contacting the uh, U.S. Department of State, and uh, contacting the White House at 456, again, you know it's 202-456-1414, 456-1414. Some startling news out of Canada. Homeschooling families cannot teach homosexuality a sin in class, homeschooling families. Under Alberta's new Education Act, homeschoolers in faith based schools will not be permitted to teach that homosexual acts are sinful as part of their academic program, says the spokesperson for the Education Minister, Thomas Lukasek. Whatever the nature of schooling, homeschool, private school, Catholic school, we do not tolerate disrespect for differences, said Donna McCall, the Assistant Director of Communication for Lukasek and uh, said this Wednesday evening, you can affirm the family's ideology in your family life. You can't do it as part of your educational study and instruction. What does a Bible teach us? Aren't we supposed to instruct our children when we sit down, when we lie down, when we rise up, when we walk by the way? Well, Canada is saying under Alberta's new Education Act, you cannot instruct your children as part of their classroom discussion against homosexuality. You can affirm that in your family life, just not in your educational studies. Reacting to the remarks, Paul Ferris of the Homeschool Legal Defense Association said the Ministry of Education is clearly signaling that they are in fact planning to violate the private conversations families have in their own homes. A government that seeks that sort of control over our personal lives should be feared and opposed. According to McCall, Christian homeschooling families can continue to impact, uh, impart biblical teachings on homosexuality in their homes as long as it's not part of their academic program of studies and instructional materials. Friends, do you see where this is going? Do you understand what this is doing as far as the government saying what you can and cannot say in your home? It cannot be part of the educational studies of a child. Isn't all of life an education? What do you do? You're teaching in in history class and say, okay, Johnny, uh, keep in mind, we're stopping school right now. Let me tell you this. God's word says homosexuality is a sin. And what we saw in Sodom and Gomorrah in our studies today, that God brought judgment. Okay, understand that? Good. Okay, now let's go back to school. Folks, where are we heading? This is taking place under Alberta. This is Canada. uh, Under their new Education Act, homeschoolers, faith-based schools, not permitted to teach that homosexual acts are sinful as part of their academic program. Well, folks, we don't have to go to Canada to see what's happening on this issue. WND reports that a Federal Freedom of Information Act lawsuit has been filed against the U.S. Navy over the manipulation of gay data used to convince Congress to overturn the centuries-old ban in the U.S. military on open homosexuality. The manipulation of the data was confirmed by the government itself, which in an inspector general's report marked for official use only said numbers were combined to present the image that members of the military approved of Barack Obama's plan for homosexuality. Yeah, they manipulated the data to fool Congress, to fool the American people, thinking the military was in favor of this. No shock to us, though, is it? But now all of a sudden, Navy being sued over this issue, Federal Freedom of Information Act request, Where else are we headed as a nation? Well, the Obama administration did an about-face concerning military policy in the Federal Defense of Marriage Act when Attorney General Eric Holder informed Congress that the Department of Justice will not stand in the way of any service member's same-sex spouses suing for military for spousal benefits. Holder wrote that he was determined that the Defense of Marriage Act, the federal law defining marriage as a union of one man and one woman, violates the Equal Protection Clause of the First Amendment. We continue. Here it is from Citizen Link, a New Jersey Superior Judge, this week, Tuesday, said that a group of same-sex couples could sue the state for violating their constitutional rights when it passed a law creating civil unions rather than same-sex marriage. It wasn't good enough they had civil unions. You need to have same-sex marriage. 
Judge Linda Feinberg based her opinion partly on the February 7th ruling from the 9th U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals declaring the California Marriage Amendment as being unconstitutional. And uh, let's continue on. As we see here, the judge Wednesday declared the 1996 Defense of Marriage Act unconstitutional, ordered the federal government to ignore the statute and provide health benefits to the wife of a lesbian federal court employee, reports WND. The ruling is by U.S. District Judge Jeffrey White, the first since the Obama administration announced a year ago it would no longer defend a law it considers discriminatory and reflects a long history of denying equal rights to gays and lesbians. So, in essence, a judge just declaring the Defense of Marriage Act is, is no good. We've conducted stories here on Crosstalk on situations that have taken place, like uh, people who operate a bed and breakfast who have denied gays and lesbians from coming in and uh, uh, renting rooms from them, or a baker who refused to make the cupcakes or wedding cakes or things for those who are promoting same-sex marriage or same-sex commitment ceremonies and on and on and on. And what happens? Well, lawsuits are brought against them because they would dare to take such a stand imposing their morality. Oh, folks... The cake cuts both ways here, doesn't it? Here is a story that comes to us out of the Dallas-Fort Worth area, the NBC station there. Dallas County Judge Tanya Parker says she will not perform marriage ceremonies until gay couples can wed in the state of Texas. She's a Dallas judge. She will not perform marriage ceremonies until gay couples can wed. During a February 21st meeting, Parker told the Stonewall Democrats of Dallas that while she has the power to perform legal marriage ceremonies in her court, she will not. Quote, I use it as my opportunity to give them a lesson about marriage inequality in the state because I feel like I have to tell them why I'm turning them away. So I usually will offer them something along the lines of, I'm sorry, I don't perform marriage ceremonies because we're in a state that does not have marriage equality. And until it does, I'm not going to partially apply the law to one group of people that doesn't apply to another group of people. And it's kind of oxymoronic for me to perform ceremonies that can't be performed for me, so I'm not going to do it. I do not perform marriages because it's not an equal application of the law, period, Parker told the Dallas Voice. Though she chooses not to perform the ceremonies, Parker said she passes marriage ceremonies on to other judges so that they can be completed. Folks, I'm sorry, I just don't accept that. How is it that we can have charges brought against people who who refuse to to make, you know, the wedding delicacies for a same-sex commitment ceremony or a wedding, And even though they will say, well, let me point you to another baker. Sorry, that's not good enough. You must be forced to do this or we're bringing action against you. Didn't we see that down in the southwest Wisconsin, too? A photographer who refused to take such pictures of of so-called marriage taking place, offering, uh, you know, to point them to other photographers. Sorry, that's not good enough. We're going to force you to do it. And now we have a judge saying, I'm not going to perform marriage ceremonies until gay couples can wed. Folks, it doesn't end there. We'll have more after this break because there's a similar story taking place out of New Mexico. Don't leave your radio. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Back to Genesis with Dr. John Morris, scientist with the Institute for Creation Research. Dr. Morris, have the laws of nature always been the same? Chris, at least one important law of nature took on modern form at the curse of Genesis 3. It tells us in Romans 8 that Adam's rebellion against God's authority caused the whole creation to groan and travail in pain under the bondage of corruption. This doesn't sound so very good to me. Present-day processes go in a downward direction rather than the upward direction, as in Genesis chapter 1. Some Christians criticize creation because natural laws couldn't accomplish it. To that, we heartily agree. Creation took different kinds of processes, supernatural processes that we don't see today. Creation was a supernatural event, and we dare not limit God by restricting Him to present processes. Let's go back to Genesis and get it right. For more information, visit our website at icr.org. I'm Chris O'Brien. Thanks for tuning in. No, 
we're, we're only going to bring actions against Christians who refuse to uh, take pictures for same-sex wedding events and, and uh, same-sex civil unions. Uh, we're only going to prosecute Christians who refuse to provide the bakery goods. We're only going to prosecute Christians who refuse to open up their homes and the bed that they rent out uh, from uh, same-sex couples who wish to come on in and utilize that. But me as a judge, no, no, I, 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 uh, I'm not going to perform these marriages of anybody, heterosexuals, until uh, we have legal uh, same-sex marriages here in the state. Well, let's continue on, because this is out of uh, New Mexico. Governor, this is Eyewitness News, uh, Channel 4, out of New Mexico, KOB.com. Governor Susanna Martinez has lost a hairstylist thanks to her position against gay marriage. Antonio Darden a popular stylist who runs Antonio's hair studio in Santa Fe said he cut Martinez's hair three times, but that's it, unless she changes her mind about gay marriage. The governor's aides called not too long ago wanting another appointment to come in, Darden said. Because of her stances and her views, I said to her aides no. They called the next day asking if I'd change my mind about taking the governor in, and I said no again. The governor has said she believes marriage should be between a man and a woman, and that does not cut it with Darden. I think it's just equality, dignity for everyone, the hairstylist said. I think everybody should be allowed the right to be together. My partner and I have been together for 15 years. Now, isn't this interesting? I'm not going to cut your hair because you believe heterosexuality is what needs to be practiced, that you will not support gay marriage. Where is the lawsuits on this one? Is it just against Christians we're seeing this take place? A very disturbing story coming out this week as well from LifeSiteNews.com. We talk about hate. We talk about intolerance. Let's talk about a 14-year-old homeschooler who testified before the Maryland State Senate against a bill that redefines marriage. And she's been now the subject of cyberbullying, vicious name-calling, and death threats against a 14-year-old girl. Her name's Sarah Crank. She told the Maryland Senate Judicial Proceedings Committee last month that she believes children need a mother and a father. How horrendous! She said, I really feel bad for the kids who have two parents of the same gender. Even though some kids think it's fine, they have no idea what kind of a wonderful experience they miss out on. Well, after her testimony went viral... It was posted on YouTube. The story went viral, and homosexual activist websites have gone ballistic. I want you to hear with your own ears what this 14-year-old said in her testimony. Hi, I'm Sarah Crank. Today is my 14th birthday, and it would be the best birthday present ever if you would vote no on gay marriage. I really feel bad for the kids who have two parents of the same gender. Even though some kids feel like it's fine, they have no idea what kind of wonderful experiences they miss out on. I don't want any more kids to get confused about what's right and okay. I really don't want to grow up in a, a world where marriage isn't such a special thing anymore. It's rather scary to think that when I grow up, the legislator or the court can change the definition of any word they want. If they can change the definition of marriage, then they could change the definition of any word. People have the choice to be gay, but I don't want to be affected by their choice. People say that they were just born that way, but I've met really nice adults who did change. So please vote no on gay marriage. Thank you. Well, that was her testimony. And that has gone on YouTube. As a result, she has been receiving horrendous responses, death threats. One a commenter, on uh, a person who commented on YouTube wrote, If I ever see this girl, I will kill her. That's a promise. Other YouTube comments range from her parents should be exterminated to kill this ki- child and his parent. For my 11th birthday would be a wonderful gift. Thanks. A comment posted on LGBTNation.com said, quote, And now everyone knows her name, so hopefully she will feel what it's like to be harassed and bullied. There's a number of other comments, but folks, I can't read them. They are so vulgar. They are so profane that I would, uh, number one, I'm not going to speak them. But this is a 14-year-old homeschool girl receiving death threats because she's asking legislators to define marriage as between one man and one woman. Where's the tolerance? LifeSiteNews.com 
Reporting a federal court in Washington state upheld the First Amendment rights of pharmacists now to refuse to distribute potentially abortifacient contraception and abortion-inducing drugs like Plan B and Ella. If doing so would violate their religious beliefs. Another story from LifeSiteNews.com reminds us, uh, oh, this is interesting, the Corporation for National and Community Service Office of Inspector General discovered that the AmeriCorps program had illegally supplied three volunteers to Planned Parenthood. Now Republican senators are opposing a budget cut that will lay off two-thirds of the Inspector General's employees and effectively end its oversight of the growing volunteer program. Isn't this interesting? The Inspector General's program found, hey, there's violation here going on, of uh, AmeriCorps workers funded with our tax dollars who are working for Planned Parenthood. So what's the response? Not that of uh, saying, oh, my, this is abuse of money. No, they want to cut the inspector general's budget now so that they have to cut back on the number of inspectors. It would require the investigative office to dismiss 26 of its 33 employees. Volunteering. At Planned Parenthood, at taxpayers' expense at the Planned Parenthood of New York, two members of the group's New York uh, City Civil Corps had worked for Planned Parenthood New York City for nine months, just one month short of their full 10-month term. And Tacoma Community College placed a third volunteer as an escort at a Washington State Planned Parenthood abortion facility shepherding women past (sighs) pro-lifers. Seven states have filed a lawsuit against the Obama administration seeking to overturn the mandate that religious employers provide contraception, sterilization, and abortifacients to their employees as part of their health care plans. This is the state attorney generals of Florida, Michigan, Nebraska, Ohio, Oklahoma, South Carolina, and Texas filed suit in U.S. District Court arguing that this violates the First Amendment and Religious Freedom Restoration Act. Oh, there's so much more here, folks. Let's go to uh, yeah, another Planned Parenthood story. Girl Scouts, another link between Planned Parenthood abortion business and the Girl Scouts has come to light. It's giving pro-life advocates further pause about their involvement in the organization. Indiana Right to Life has learned the city of Bloomington, Indiana website 2009 reported the direct involvement of a Planned Parenthood health and sexuality educator in the development of a Girl Scouts program targeted to girls as young as five years old, reports LifeNews.com. In its report on the 2009 Woman of the Year and Lifetime Contribution Award, the site notes that Anne Reese was nominated posthumously for the Lifetime Contribution Award. The report continues that Anne's career started with Planned Parenthood in Bloomington, where she worked for many years as a health and sexuality educator and helped initiate the Family Life Education Program for Girl Scouts ages 5 to 18 throughout a 12-county area. Remember George Tiller? George Tiller, who uh, was involved in late-term abortions, well, LifeNews.com reporting, that the Kansas State Board of Healing Arts, February 21st, who revoked the medical license of abortionist Ann Kristen Newhouse. Now the facts come out that show late-term abortionist George Tiller was doing illegal late-term abortions for at least seven years. Troy Newman of Operation Rescue said if the evidence presented in Newhouse's case had been presented during Tiller's criminal crime, there is no doubt that he would have been convicted of illegal late-term abortions. Another topic... KHOU Channel 11 out of Houston. Passengers aboard a Continental Airlines flight bound for Houston Tuesday sprang into action to help a flight attendant having trouble with an unruly passenger. 20 minutes after the plane departed uh, departed from Portland, pilots returned to the city where the FBI was waiting. Passenger said the unruly man was a problem from the beginning after boarding flight 1113. The man became upset because he was not seated next to his friend. Then after the flight took off, he ignored the no-smoking sign and tried to light an electric uh, cigarette. A flight attendant asked the passenger to turn off the cigarette, but he refused. The Middle Eastern man started screaming at the smaller woman. He was screaming, Allah is great! Allah is great, said Nancy Haywood, passenger. All it kind of worries you when what that when that happens, but believe me, there were enough men to hold him down, and they did. Men on the plane jumped up and ran to assist the flight attendant. The passenger and his companion taken into custody when the plane landed. What does the TSA say? Well, the issue was uh, this incident was not a security issue. 
Let's uh, take a look at another issue. Uh, This one going on from uh, uh, Vic played on Crosstalk the other day, this apology from uh, the U.S. commander about the burning of the Qurans. Well, as protesters rage across Afghanistan, Afghanistan, Fox News reporting, these uh, protests have been raging now for three days in response to the burning of the Qurans at a U.S. military base. Some are questioning whether the parade of apologies that the U.S. government may do are producing more harm than good. The latest installment came Thursday, yesterday, when the U.S. ambassador delivered an apology letter from President Obama to Afghan President Hamid Karzai. The, uh, this follows apologies that have already come from Afghanistan Commander General John Allen, which Vic played the other day, NATO's Inter- International Security Assistance Force, and other Pentagon officials. The backlash began after Qurans were burned with garbage at a military base in Afghanistan. Officers said that they removed from the detention center li- library because the detainees were using them to pass secret and what they described as extremist messages one to another. Afghans uh, stepped in to rescue the books, though they were already burned. One official said it was a breakdown in judgment, not a breakdown in our respect for Islam. Meanwhile, nearly a dozen people have died in the aftermath, including two U.S. troops. Some analysts are criticizing the U.S. response. Nina Shea, who is with the Hudson Institute, said it just uh, uh, feeds the sense of grievance at this constant round of apologies. Obama's letter yesterday reportedly apologized for the error and uh, assured Karzai that the U.S. government would take appropriate steps to make sure there, uh, such an incident does not happen again, to include holding accountable those responsible. The uh, U.S. government uh, continues repeatedly apologizing for the incident. And uh, Schaefer is saying, Lieutenant Colonel Tony Schaefer, an Army Reserve officer, saying this is only helping the Taliban. They will use that to, again, flame their own fire. The more they apologize, the more it's going to inflame them. White House Press Secretary Jay Carney yesterday said the president's latest response to the uh, Karzai letter was extremely or rather entirely appropriate due to the sensitivities involved. What about the Christians? What about the Christians? Here we are. uh, White House senior advisor, Newsmax.com reports, Valerie Jarrett has adopted a stance on unemployment that is sure to infuriate many, arguing that it stimulates the economy because people who receive unemployment checks are going to go out and spend them. Even though we had a terrible economic crisis three years ago throughout our country, many people were suffering before the last three years, particularly in the black community, she said. And so we need to make sure that we continue to support this important safety net. It is not only good for the family, it's good for the economy. She argued uh, this during her speaking event at a North Carolina Central University in Durham, North Carolina. She said people who receive that unemployment check go out and spend it and help stimulate the economy. So that's healthy as well. Yeah. The more people we can get on food stamps, the more we can get on unemployment benefits, the more we're going to stimulate the economy. I have one other actuality news bite I'm going to play for you after the break, and then after that we'll open the phone lines to get your response to these issues here today. You're listening to Crosstalk on VCY America. Many textbooks have revised our true history. Such is often the case with George Washington, the first president of the United States. Now available as a special edition is the reprinting of a vintage 1842 original entitled Life of Washington. You'll be able to pull back the dark shrouds of secular revisionist history and meet the humble believer, godly leader, and devoted son who became a fledgling country's source of strength and inspiration. Constantly seeking to serve others and to place God first, George Washington was a revered and reverent man. This rare historic biography will help you discover the man behind the title, Father of Our Country. From letters and personal accounts comes a man who lived by and was led by a deep and abiding faith. This hardcover book, Life of Washington, is available for a donation of $20 by calling 1-800-729-9829. Simply ask for the book, The Life of Washington, when you call 1-800-729-9829. 
Well, this is a news roundup Friday here today on Crosstalk, and I see I have so much more uh, to say than what time allows. So I just want to report a couple other stories here. Uh, we told you about this continental flight uh, headed to Houston and the unruly passenger yelling out, Allah is great, Allah is great. Well, uh, on a related story, WND is reporting, the headline caught my attention, offended Muslim chokes atheist, and then, well, a Muslim judge in Pennsylvania scolded a local atheist for offending Islam, called him a doofus, and accused him of using the First Amendment to madden Muslims, dismissing harassment charges against the Muslim defendant who purportedly choked the atheist during a Halloween parade. District Judge Mark Martin brought a Koran to court and told the alleged victim, American Atheist Pennsylvania State Director Ernest Pierce V, I think you've misinterpreted a couple things, so before you start mocking someone else's religion, you might want to find out a little more about it. It kind of makes you look like a doofus. Interesting, coming from a United States judge. He is, uh, by the way, threatening to post the uh, judge's comments uh, on on uh, the, posting the audio of those, and he's been told he'll be held in contempt of court if he did. Uh, we're going to see what transpires there. I mentioned this audio clip here that I had from CNSNews.com. It deals with our president. Um, It's this We Can't Wait initiative that he's on right now, saying if Congress won't act, I will. Well, he is sitting at an event here this week, in which he's saying, a part of this initiative, that uh, if Congress does not enact his policies in the future, he'll continue to forge ahead on his own. When Congress refuses to act, Joe and and I are going to act, referring to the vice president at his side. In the months to come, wherever we have an opportunity, we're going to take steps on our own to keep this economy going. With or without Congress, I'm going to continue to fight for them. And uh, I want you to hear the comment, to hear the president himself as he spoke these very words. Whenever Congress refuses to act, uh, Joe and I, we're going to act. Uh, In the months to come, wherever we have an opportunity, we're going to take steps on our own to keep this economy moving. And with or without Congress, every day I'm going to be continuing to fight with them. I do hope Congress joins me. Instead of spending the coming months in a lot of phony political debates, focusing on the next election. Um, excuse me, who is who is focusing on the next election? Who's involved in phony political debates? Well, if Congress refuses to act, Joe and I are going to act. Watch out for that executive order pen, folks. And I want to close with this story here today. Another just outrageous. You, you just don't believe this, these kind of things happen. But it's let's go back down to Texas, Houston. KTRH reporting about the Sci Fair school officials. Um, there is a teacher there that sent a poem mailed home to parents with a memo which said this Attached is a chant about President Barack Obama. All kindergartners will be required to learn the chant for the Black History Program. That's right. Sent home a poem with kindergartners. Attached is a chant about President Barack Obama. All kindergartners will be required to learn the chant for the Black History Program. Here is the chant. Who really likes to play basketball? Obama really likes to play basketball. Who's going to answer every call? Every call, basketball. Outside the box, Chicago White Sox, resident, president. Whose famous slogan is, yes, we can? Obama's favorite slogan is, yes, we can. Who do we know is the man? Barack Obama is the man. He's our man. Yes, we can. Every call, basketball. Outside the box, Chicago White Sox. Resident president. Who won a Grammy for Dreams of My Father? Obama won a Grammy for Dreams of My Father. Now can you guess who's a famous author? Barack Obama is a famous author. Folks, is this indoctrination or what? That poem was mailed home to parents with a memo. Again, it said all kindergartners will be required to learn the chant for the Black History Program. 
Parent Joseph Beaver told KTRH News he doesn't believe the poem provides any educational value to students. Cypher ISD officials... Admit the poem was sent to parents without administrative approval, and the teacher has since apologized. And uh, we are told that the chant, the news story reports here, the chant was selected by the kindergarten team of teachers sent home prior to receiving the approval of the principal, and now the school officials have pulled what some consider a pro-Obama poem from next week's Black History Month program at Tips Elementary. After a parent complained, it was too political for the daughter's kindergarten class. They say what some consider a pro-Obama poem. Let's open the phone lines and get your rea- reaction to these stories here today, whether it's about the poem, whether it is about the matters of uh, uh, the Iranian pastor, Yosef Nardikani, whether it be that of the young 14-year-old who is uh, being, uh, well, death threats for saying that marriage is between a man and a woman and trying to get legislators to, to pass that? What about the, uh, the, uh, the, the hairstylist refusing to cut the governor's hair because the governor takes one man, one woman for marriage? Our number to crosstalk, 800-733-9829. 1-800-733-9829. If you'd like to share your reaction today here on Crosstalk, again, that's 800-733-9829, taking your phone calls today. And as we're uh, taking those calls here, uh, let me just say this, uh, another interesting story from WND. Marco Rubio, the Florida senator who is, who's considering a, being considered as a top prospect for the vice presidential nomination. Did you know, according to this story, he became a member of the Mormon church while his family lived in Nevada during his childhood? Uh, that's according to a report on the political blog BuzzFeed. Family members told the publication that Rubio was baptized in the Mormon church at about the age of eight, along with some of his family members when they lived in Nevada. Several years later, he left the Mormon church and rejoined the Catholic church, the report says. Uh, Mormonism, by the way, has become an issue in this year's GOP presidential race because of Mitt Romney's LDS membership. Uh, Former Governor John Huntsman, who has dropped out of the Republican race, also a Mormon. A report in the Salt Lake Tribune, located in the shadow of the Mormon Church's massive headquarters complex in Utah, confirmed that Rubio attended the Mormon Church ages 8 to 11. Kind of an interesting story there. Well, let's go to the phone lines here today on Crosstalk, our number 800-733-9829. Sue in Hermiston, Oregon, you're on the air. Hi, thank you. The first thing I want to comment on really quickly is these extended uh, un- uh, unemployment benefits. You know, if we do that with people in medical considerations and they're out there so long and they have to go back to work, there's a psychological block there. They're also out of being disciplined to going to work. They also like the paycheck that comes in, a sick leave or whatever, and also the fact that they're open for food things and uh, well, so, welfare. So let's do what the story, what the, the story said that this is a... Uh, a stimulus to the economy, and uh, that it's good for us to do that. Uh, no, it's not, not in the long run. And the other thing I'll comment on is the poem. You know, uh, uh, our president has says we've got a wonderful future ahead, and it's for the children, and, you know, it's going to be there in the world in all sorts of ways, and now they're singing the poem that he is our man, and we love him, and there is no other. No, excuse me. That's what they sang to Hitler. My mistake. Thank you for your thoughts here today. Nancy in Roscoe, Illinois, you're on the air. Hi. Hi. And thank you for taking my call. Mm -hmm. Um, I just was um, listening to your program. I listen off and on, and I was wondering, um, you really uh, are on homosexuality a lot. And I was wondering, uh, I, I don't want to be offensive, <laughs> but um, how does this glorify God? A homosexuality does not glorify God, Nancy. That's what I mean. I, you're talking about it all the time. It well, seems Nancy, like it's, um, you're 
putting strife instead of glorifying God. Oh, my, my Nancy, what we're doing is we're upholding God's Word, and we believe upholding God's Word glorifies God. Uh, God condemned the sin of homosexuality, and what we have is a nation that has gone berserk on this issue. We have judge after judge striking down laws that say marriage is between one man and one woman. They're overturning courts. They're, they're promoting homosexual marriage. Our, our, the, the, the executive of this nation, the president, will, is refusing to defend marriages between a man and a woman. God's yeah. word says it's an abomination. Absolutely. So it should be an abomination to us. Mm-hmm. And we have no business uh, entering into God's work. God, uh, ma- ma- I, mean, ma- God, I want to correct you that we have every business entering into God's work. He said to occupy till I come. Go about doing the business of the Lord until he comes again. I'm talking about judging people. God no, is the perfect just judge, ab- absolutely. and he will be the judge absolutely. of homosexuality. Absolutely. We have not uh, the right. We have the right to teach our children that that is an abomination to God. Not, not if you're in Alberta, Canada, you can't. And that's why I oh, shared sure that story. Can. Well, ma'am, if you did, you listen to the story. Yes. Okay. And you if you if you can. homeschool, yeah, you just can't make it part of your academics. That's right. And and you have no problem with that. No. My. Okay, Nancy, uh, thank you for your call here today, um, folks. Do you agree or disagree with Nancy James in Pensacola? You're on the air. Hello. Go ahead, James. Yes, I would like to uh, comment. You know, the very fact that homosexuals have to fight for, quote, their rights is the libel that shows me that this is not... uh, I feel sorry for these people because you don't have to uh, defend marriage. And I know it's a saying you do have to stand up against wrong, but the very fact that they're having to fight for rights as as homosexuals shows how of an abomination this is. Even nature tells us this is an abomination. Yeah. So what it shows me, and what, I've, uh, what the Lord's been dealing with me on for the last week or so, is as these last days are coming more and more evil, I'm becoming more aware that this is how serious this is. Uh, frankly, it's evil versus God. Yeah. When you cut the chase to all of this, and when you put your spiritual discernment on, it is becoming more and more evident to me how this is all heading toward, in time, anti-Christ spirit. Yeah. And uh, that, that's all I wanted to tell you. Have you noticed the same thing? I, I certainly have, James, and, and it is intensifying. It's like entering the final two minutes of a football game where you see all these events just intensifying, and the issues are becoming a very intense and uh, just escalating in, in their importance for us to deal with them. That's exactly right. We were at a, a, a Bible meeting, a Bible study, about a month ago, almost. And that's what the sense was that the Christians among there, there's going to be an acceleration of wicked and of evil, as the end times approach. Now, nobody knows the hour, obviously. Mm-hmm. But you can be a discerner of the times, and Christ talked about that. Yeah. He, they're Pharisees. Thank you. Uh, I, I've got okay. to run here. Thanks Thanks for the call. We have a quick 60-second break. We'll come back to more of your phone calls. Nancy, uh, we are to reprove the works of darkness. Check it out. We'll be right back. For the Worldview Weekend Minute, I'm Brandon House. Our website's worldviewweekend.com. As we look at Romans chapter 1, we're trying to understand, is God judging America? Has God removed his divine hand of protection and given us over, given us over to the things that our nation is pursuing, homosexuality, violence and debased culture, pagan spirituality, the worship of nature, uh, corrupt leaders who practice immorality, encourage others to do the same? These are all the things we see in Romans 1. But Romans 1, verse 23 says that they also take the incorruptible God, and they transform him into an image like corruptible man. Isn't that interesting? We have a man running for president, Mitt Romney, a Mormon, and Mormons have taken the incorruptible God. They've made him into an image like corruptible man. Mormons believe God was a man of flesh and bone who evolved become God. I could go into 
several of the other people running for president. But this is just one example where maybe God is giving us leaders that fit with what we see in Romans, people who have transformed God into a corruptible man. Uh, beware homeschoolers, uh, you know, because the likes of what Nancy was saying there, when I asked the question, uh, you don't have a problem with the government saying in your homeschool program and teaching your children that you cannot speak against homosexuality? She said, no, <laughs> no problem with that. Folks, where are we headed? Where are we headed? And it's just uh, just not too far before that's going to come across this border here as well. Let's get back to the lines here. Zoe in Savoy, Illinois, you're on the air. Hi. Uh, I don't usually call in on issues like this, but um, I was just kind of thinking as you were talking about this judge who didn't want to perform the marriage ceremony and the hairstylist. Well, I wouldn't sue them because um, I kind of have the attitude. I don't want Christians to be made to, say, perform a marriage ceremony that they don't right. believe in. And I don't want to make um, somebody else do it for the same reason, I just believe, you know, in them letting me be free. And as long as they don't, um, if they don't want to marry me, I don't want them to. Yeah. If they don't want to style my hair, I don't want them to. And if they don't want to style my hair, I don't think a man should be made, or anybody should be made to do it if they don't want to. I yeah. wouldn't want to be made to style someone's hair if I didn't. Yeah, you know, and, like something about their... Zoe, my my point in all that was simply this. I know, and 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 that Turn is about. But I just am. I'm just trying to say that, you know, maybe it'd be better if we emphasize the uh, part that you know, let me have my belief. You have your beliefs, but leave me alone. Okay, <laughs> thank you, Zoe. I appreciate your call. My my point in all of this simply was that there is national outrage whenever we have a Christian that refuses to succumb. Uh, to to uh, placating homosexuality in the workplace or whatever the venue might be. Look at the Macy's employee uh, who was fired because of not allowing a cross-dresser into the room. And it became a national issue. But where is the, the, where is the outrage here in this case? I mean, I um, appreciate your call. My, my point was a little bit broader, though, is that we, we see such an outrage against Christianity. Uh, why is that outrage not also true the other way? Jake, you're next in Michigan. Thank you for holding. Hi, how are you? Fine, thank you. Oh, uh, I have a few things to say. I mean, um, uh, to, to, uh, we're all, you know, created. We're equal. We have equal rights in this country. And and to shoot someone down because their beliefs in homosexuality is they're fringe in American society. We need equal marriage. We need men holding hands, walking down the street together. We we, we need, need that, Jake. Women talking, holding hands. Jake, uh, should should somebody who's thirty uh, years old be able to marry a fourteen year old? What are you talking? This is bringing a whole other realm into the into the conversation. Uh, no, no, uh, Jake. Uh, should a thirty year old be able to marry a fourteen year old? Why are you changing this? The, 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 we're talking about gay uh, marriage here, uh, let's, right? Can a thirty year old marry a fourteen year old? That's a subject that is. I mean, that's just... okay. Okay. What what you're pointing out is that you're hesitant to answer that because your answer is no. It's not right. So I'd say, where's the equality with that? What about those who want to marry multiple partners? Where's the equality with that? We say no. Marriage is between two people. Uh, where's the equality with that? We already have laws in our nation that say that people that are uh, near of kin to one another cannot marry one another. Where is the, the outrage against that from taking place? Look at your arguments there, Jake. They just don't hold up. Mark in Kansas, go ahead. You're on the air. Hey, Jim. Uh, Pastor Mark, I yes. enjoyed meeting you at Fort Scott. Likewise. And uh, I wanted to address the caller that talked about uh, we are not to judge. And uh, in uh, Matthew 7, 1, it says we're not to judge hypocritically. But if you look at John chapter 7, verses 14 through 24, you'll see that Jesus of the Father is coming against the Pharisees of man. And they are condemning him, yet they are the lawbreakers. So they are hypocritically judging, as Matthew 7, 1 says, not to. And then Jesus, knowing that we have to discern theology, uh, tells them that they need to judge. And if you look at verse 24, he says, Stop judging by mere appearance and make a right 
judgment. Righteous judgment. Jesus has always communicated that we're to make a true and correct, non-hypocritical judgment. So this idea where people say, judge not, lest ye be judged, is is a sickening thing to continue to hear. Jesus says, John chapter 7, verse 24, you are to judge correctly. Hmm. God bless you, Pastor Mark. Thank you so much for your comment. Bye-bye. Brad in West Dallas, you're on the air. Hi, Jim. I disagree with you, Jim. I don't think uh, Jake didn't answer because the answer was no about a 30-year-old marrying a 14-year-old. I think he didn't have a problem with it, and that's why Hmm. he didn't answer. Hmm. But uh, anyway... Uh, the uh, sodomites and the straight people all have the same rights right now. We can all marry one member of the opposite gender yes. right now. That's they don't like that. That's not good enough for them, but that's tough. Now, uh, people like this judge that says, oh, I'm not going to marry anybody because we don't have equal rights with you know, marriage of gays and such, she doesn't think straight. Her heart is hardened. She's separated from God, and therefore she can't think straight. And uh, this is the kind of people we get when we turn our, our back on God. And as, as for that lady that said, oh, you know, uh, food stamps and giving money to the, to the poor or whatever is good for the economy because they spend it, well, the people that you took it from in the first place can spend it too. Hmm. As a matter of fact, they can do a lot better job, and you wouldn't have to pay, pay for the operation to confiscate it in the first place. So why don't we just lower everybody's taxes instead? Thank you, Brad. Thank you. Appreciate it. Bye. And uh, final call today from Ty in Wisconsin. You're on the air. Yes, uh, the pastor's already answered, uh, re- remarked about the Nancy who called in and talked about why we need to speak against uh, homosexuality and that. From a, from a worldly standpoint, she needs to understand this. Dr. Lawrence Lessinger on her report show reported about the Diagnostic Statistical Manual, which is used to define major. In volume one, homosexuality was considered abnormal. In volume two, it was considered normal. And now in volume three, it is considered actually a preferred behavior. So that means, and it says this in the Diagnostic Statistical Manual that you can look up, that my eight-year-old son can be uh, used by a homosexual man because it says in the manual it's for his social development. Yeah. Yeah. And we get to a point that it's for their social development, and that's what they're trying to push in the school. We have an anything-goes mentality, and that's the world of Satan and the world that he wants to have and the world that he wants to create. And she needs to get in touch with the Lord and know and read her Bible and understand what this is all about. Thank you, Ty. I appreciate your call, and we are out of time here on Crosstalk today. Folks, we don't present these stories to bring discouragement to you, but certainly to challenge you to walk faithfully with the Lord. Read God's Word, know it, obey it, live it, and uh, certainly understand that the times we live, we need to be salt and need to be light. We need to be praying for our nation. Thanks for joining us this week here on Crosstalk. You've been listening to Crosstalk via satellite and the Internet from BCY America. Views expressed may or may not be those of this station. For a CD of today's program, send a donation of $6 or more to VCY Tape Ministry, 3434 West Kilbourne Avenue, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, 53208. Or download by RSS or podcast from crosstalkamerica.com. And join us again for Crosstalk.